Next up, we have uh, a substitution. So this is um, Sam, Sam, Sam Whiting. Yeah. Sam Whiting uh, is speaking instead of Todd Moon, who is uh, on the uh, schedule, but uh, speaking about the same topic, direction of arrival analysis on a mobile platform. Uh, so thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Is this, does this sound good? Loud enough? All right. Thank you. All right. Um, I'm Sam Whiting. I'm from Utah State University, and uh, Dan Sorensen and Todd Moon are here with me, and they worked on this, uh, this project for direction of arrival analysis, or angle of arrival. All right, so we started out about a year ago, and um, we wanted to keep this simple. We just had a couple of objectives. We wanted to find a transmitter. It's a pretty basic uh, problem, and, and we wanted to be mobile. And so this is kind of a, a picture of a, a teaser of what an Android app might look like uh, that, that does this kind of analysis. Many of you may have seen a YouTube video put up a couple years ago by Tatu Patola. And it was really cool. He had, uh, this picture is really low resolution, sorry. But he had this array of three antennas. And then he would hook them into his uh, uh, he would sample the data with some RTL dongles, I believe, and then he would generate this field pattern kind of arrow on his laptop you see there that pointed to wherever he was transmitting from with his little ham radio. And you can just barely see the ham radio up in the, the top right corner of that picture. And it was a really cool project. We liked it, and uh, we liked how his setup worked. And so we wanted to do something similar. As we looked into some of the hardware options, uh, a lot of the people we're using these RTL dongles because they're really cheap. And a lot of the people wanted them to be coherent. They wanted them to be synchronized. And that required, in many cases, people to have the same clock, to have a, a, a single clock that was driving both of these receivers. And so with that in mind, we, we started looking at our RTL dongles we had been playing with. And we said, yeah, I think we can wire these clocks together. This is a pretty common mod that people do. And right as we were about to get started on that, we saw an article for uh, this website, CoherentReceiver.com, that, that pretty much did the same thing, but far better than we could have done it. And so we said, great, let's, let's get some of those. And so the picture here is two RTL dongles, and they're just running off of a single clock. And it's a really nice setup. And so here's just a two-channel receiver based off those RTL dongles. Since we wanted to be mobile, we needed to uh, have something to process our data with. and so. What better to work with than a, a smartphone? So we're running with these RTL dongles that are sharing a clock and just a, a Motorola smartphone. So as far as methods go for angle of arrival or direction of arrival analysis, there's a lot of options and a lot of research that's already been done in these areas. Uh, one of the most common ones that I kept coming across was music, multiple signal classification. and uh, I don't know how it works exactly, but many of you may recognize the plots that come out of it. They're the really spiky looking plots that, that have an, an x-axis that represents the angles all around your uh, antenna array. And then there's peaks wherever there's energy, right? And so you have, maybe you're looking for a signal and your little plot that comes out of music has a really strong peak at whatever angle you're, you're concerned with. Um, other methods such as MVDR, MVDR is kind of similar. Uh, cross-correlation, you can do cool things with cross-correlation, right? If we are looking, if we have a couple of antennas and we look at uh, which antenna picks up the signal first, then you can kind of start making some statements about, oh, this, this antenna received my signal first, so our signal's coming from this direction and, and some stuff like that. So this is actually where we started. We started with cross-correlation because we were just, we figured that was pretty easy to, to get our feet wet with this. And so cross-correlation, um, it didn't end up giving us the results we wanted, but it, it still proved to be important, so we're going to talk about it for a second. Cross-correlation is pretty simple, right? It's a basically convolution, um, and we can do it really efficiently in the frequency domain. And this is easy to implement in GNU Radio, even just using the standard blocks here. The basic stream of data, if we, if we just have these RTL sources on the left, would be take an FFT of each of our streams of data, do the conjugate multiplication, and then do the inverse FFT. So many of you may have, may have thrown together a flow graph like this just for 
analyzing a signal or something or searching for a signal or, or any of many reasons, but they're pretty easy to implement. And uh, the problem with using this for direction of arrival analysis comes from the, the resolution we're getting. So these RTL dongles are pulling in samples at about two megahertz. And since the speed of light happens to be kind of fast, that only gives us a resolution of about 150 meters for every sample of difference in our cross correlation. So we were sitting here in our lab and we were moving our antennas around and we were wondering why we weren't seeing any changes in the cross correlation and then we, we stopped for a minute and we sat down and we realized, oh, we're gonna have to move 150 meters apart to see one sample of difference in our cross correlation. And, and our cables were definitely not that long. So we moved on from there. We, uh, we needed to use cross correlation, however, because our sample or our RTL dongles didn't start at the same time. We didn't really realize this coming into it. We didn't know what we were working with. And, and even though these RTL dongles are sharing a clock, they start taking samples at different moments in time. And so you have these two streams of data that may be thousands of samples apart. And that, that messes with all of our other calculations that we were doing. So this proved to be important. Cross correlation was really important to us because it, it allowed us to calibrate our two dongles to synchronize the data. If we were to do cross correlation all the time, constantly, it would be kind of expensive uh, computationally. So what we ended up doing is we made this block, this custom block called sample offset. And the basic idea behind it is we're just gonna do cross correlation a couple times at the beginning, take the median uh, peak values from it, so just find how apart our two signals are, and then stop doing the computations. We don't need to waste our time doing this over and over again because the, they have the same clock, so they're not gonna get farther apart. So this sample offset block takes, um, in this case it says five iterations, so we do five cross correlations, and we get this value that says, let's say it output the value 400, there's a peak at 400 in our cross correlation. That means our two sample streams are 400 samples apart, and so, we need to delay one of our sample streams by 400 samples, and then they'll be lined up. And so you can see the two RTL sources again on the left, and if you kind of follow the lower chain, they're gonna feed into the sample offset block. The sample offset block will tell the, um, will output a value that tells us how far apart these two signals are, and you can follow that dotted feedback line there to, to the delay block and the delay block will delay one of the signals, and now, now our two signals are lined up. So I know I'm, I'm throwing some custom blocks out here, and we'll talk about that in a minute. The delay block is the exact same as the standard delay block, except with message control. We ended up needing to, to use messages for a lot of our feedback, so um, it's, it's pretty standard. So now that our signals are lined up, we can do some of these phase methods because these phase methods are really uh, sensitive, um, which is good. We need sensitivity to, to detect these small changes, but it, it required this synchronization. So our signals are lined up, and we're gonna do uh, an eigenvector method to find the phase difference between our two signals. The reason we like this method instead of uh, something like music or some of these other methods we were looking at is we can do it at a really, really low rate we can do this with one kilosamples per second of data and still get really good results. And it's, uh, it's, it worked out to be a pretty simple solution. The general idea, the equation here might not uh, look too, I mean, maybe it's just nonsense, right, to people who haven't been looking at this for a while. But the general idea behind it, if we want to get kind of an intuitive idea of what's going on, is W is this steering array. It steers our phased array of antennas and it's just going to sweep around until it finds the maximum power. And wherever that maximum power is, it's just gonna give us that phase difference. So we're sweeping around our phased array of antennas looking for the maximum power. And to, to boil this whole method down to three simple steps, we estimate a covariance matrix of our two streams of data. We're just averaging samples. We're gonna find the maximum eigenvalue of that uh, covariance matrix, and then all we do is we return the argument of that eigenvector that corresponds to the maximum eigenvalue. 
And so this, this, um, this method returns to us just an angle. Some of the other methods, common methods, make those plots like I was talking about, and you get power at every angle, or you can kind of see a, how a whole bunch of signals are working together to, to hit your antenna array. But this method just gives us the angle, and that's all we wanted. We needed to keep this simple if we wanted to be mobile. So when I hear eigenvector and eigenvalue, sometimes my eyes gloss over and I say, oh, this is uh, some weird math trick that uh, is unknown and unknowable. But what it turns out to be is three lines of code, basically, to, to solve for these eigenvectors. And I'm not expecting you guys to read it and understand what's going on in our cryptic C++ code here. But it, it basically boils down to an analytical solution for a two by two matrix to find the eigenvectors and eigenvalues. And so this is what it looks like. It's really not uh, too complicated. This is the, the block as seen in GNU Radio Companion. It's labeled PCADOA right there. Immediately before the block, there's a lot of downsampling. So as I said, we can downsample a lot, and this, this still works great, which we were happy with. So this brings us to the other, uh, the other problem we ran into when we started running this flow graph. Our signals were lined up in time to the nearest sample, but they weren't phase coherent. They didn't have the same, uh, they weren't in phase yet. And so this, this plot, I'm, let me do my best to explain it here. Let's look at the blue dots first, the blue nonsense dots, as they look like on this plot. We took two RTL dongles, fed them from the same antenna, and then calculated the phase difference between these two dongles, what they were receiving. And so in the perfect ideal world, um, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't have any phase difference because they were looking at the same data, right? So that is definitely not the case, as you can see with the blue dots. They're scattered all over the, the plot here from 0 to 2 pi. And so what that tells me is that just out of the box, these RTL dongles, if I try and do any kind of direction of arrival analysis, that involves a phase difference, I'm going to get junk because the phase difference is uh, pretty much random. And you can do some interesting stuff if you, if you unwrap the phase, and, but uh, that's not what this is about right now. The red dots are the coherent, receival don coherent receiver dongles we got, the ones with the common clock. And as we expected and as we hoped, there's a constant phase difference. It's not all over the place. It's very predictable, right? So they're looking at the same signal, and the phase difference is not changing. However, it's not at zero either. So they're not exactly phase coherent yet. They're not perfectly lined up. And so that, that brings us to our other, um, our other synchronization we needed. If we really wanted to start doing measurements with this phase difference, then we needed to know that our two dongles were exactly phase coherent, that they were lined up. Luckily, this can be corrected by, by addition. Our y-intercept on our plot here is around 5 and a half radians or something. So all we have to do is subtract 5 and a half radians, and now there's zero phase difference between our two receivers, and we're happy. Um, to do this, we made a couple more custom blocks. And I know this, this picture might be, make some of you cringe, because there's so many out-of-tree module blocks here that uh, I'll, I'll explain them. The PCA DOA block is their phase difference one. We get our phase difference out, and then we're going to add this constant value. We're going to add this calibration value, the, the y-intercept from the plot before. We need to shift that value. We need to make sure that it's still in the range from negative pi to pi, because we don't want to, to start spitting out angles that are far away from this principal region. And now, if you follow the, the track down after the pi to pi block, you see a, a hold state block and a, a message sync block. This is what turns the calibration mode on and off. We needed two states. We needed to say, it's time to calibrate, or it's time to take a measurement. Because at a certain point, we're going to be expecting a phase difference. We wanted this to, to use the phase difference to measure DOA. So the hold state block is a custom block that we made to say, to say either start the calibration, so zero out our phase difference, or let it take measurements. This slide, if, uh, if any of you want to look over it later, it, it just kind of explains simply what the custom blocks do. We talked about most of them as they came up. The sample offset block does cross-correlation once or n times. The PCA-DOA block does the phase difference. 
Um, a couple of the blocks we made at the very bottom there, the delay and the add constant F, or add constant float blocks, they're pretty much the same as the GNU radio blocks that already, already do those things, but we just needed to be able to control them with messages. And so they're, they're the same implementation. We just went through and added message control for these blocks. The reason we needed message control is the, the way to do some of these kind of feedback operations in GNU radio right now uses Python. And our next step was to move everything to C++. So we needed to, to have a C++ style way to do this feedback. So this is the complete flow graph for our direction of arrival analysis. And we can, we can step through it here really quick. The RTL sources on the left, if you follow them down, they feed this sample offset block. That sample offset block calculates how far apart our two signals are and delays one of them until they're lined up. So now our signals are lined up and we can downsample our data because we uh, don't care as much. Um, we can downsample a lot before we do this phase difference method. Once we get the phase difference method, we need to be able to calibrate that phase difference to zero. We need to be able to line up our receivers in phase. After that, we have this phase to DOA block to map a phase difference to a real angle in the real world, in the physical world. And that's uh, an arc cosine function with our antenna geometry. It's just, it's just uh, trigonometry. And then we have a, a multiply constant block on there. I think that was just us changing it from uh, radians to degrees. So that, that kind of fulfills our first requirement. We finally got this direction of arrival analysis working, and now we wanted to, to start making this mobile so it was a, a system we could carry around. And this is where uh, the, the people who are funding our research, the Laboratory for Telecommunication Sciences in Maryland, they had an awesome template application in Android that let us run GNU radio flow graphs. So we just took their template and we modified it to, to our needs. And this is, that's what you're seeing here. That's what this image is of. It's an Android app that gathers the parameters in Java. So you can enter things like sample rate and uh, what frequency you're looking at. And then what it does is it basically just runs your flow graph with those parameters. You make the flow graph in C++ and compile into an executable and then just call it out of, out of Android using uh, the, the Java native interface that Android supports. Between C++ and Java, we can communicate using UDP packets to kind of fling data back and forth. So that's how we control when we're calibrating and when we're not calibrating. And that's how we get our phase difference data back out as well. So now that we have our data in Java, we can do cool things. We can do fun stuff like make these arrows um, to represent where the, the phase or the angle of arrival is. And we can add things like the compass ring you see around it. That compass ring just spins around, right, uh, using the phone's accelerometer and to kind of give you a heading. Um, we can add map functionality, too. The phone has a GPS, right? So we can use GPS data and save directions of arrival from as points on the map. and so. That's, that was kind of the end goal here. We wanted to, to get this working on a phone. And, and this is our beautiful prototype made with plywood and tape, of course, because that is what we had to work with. That's what we found laying around the lab, I should say. And I even have our, our silly little prototype right here. It's a half wavelength spacing antenna array with two antennas. And this is centered at the, the family radio band, uh, just the free band that you can get a lot of walkie-talkies for. And as you can see, we, we just have the two RTL dongles sitting there, plugged into the antennas. They're plugged into a USB hub, and the USB hub plugs into the phone. Uh, we tested this out with just some generic walkie-talkies. These are just uh, cheap walkie-talkies, right, that do FM voice. FM modulation to, to communicate. And so we would just have these walkie-talkies, and someone would have a walkie-talkie, and they'd walk around. And the other person would try and find them using the, the antenna array. They'd try and watch the arrow on the app and, and see where it was pointing and see if it was actually tracking where this transmitter was. And so that was, uh, that, that was what we were doing six months ago or something. We were walking around with this antenna array. You can see our other beautiful plywood prototype here. This one has string, so it's even, even nicer. But 
and Velcro. But the I have a video saved. Are we able to play YouTube videos? Can I just stream this from here? Maybe not. You should be able to. I should be able to? Thanks. Sorry, if I can figure out how to work your work the mouse, right? <coughs> so what you're seeing right now is the phone is, there's no transmitter. And right there, we started transmitting. Dana, who's sitting over there and, and standing up in the video, is walking around with the walkie-talkie. And you can see the red arrow as it tracks him as he walks around. And so as he moves, you can see the arrow tracks where he's at. And then in a second here, he'll stop transmitting. And, and what happens when you're not transmitting is it's just looking at the, the noise in the system. And so you're not really getting any, any real data out. And here he starts transmitting again. And so it's just, it was a, a lot of fun to, to go out and field test this because we were able to see, hey, I know where Dana is. I can, I can find him now electromagnetically. So we have another video here, too. Um, This one's just integrating it with, with the map functionality. It actually doesn't show up too well in the video because we're not the best videographers. But the, the general idea of this one is you walk around, you save your DOA, the, the direction of arrival estimate you get when you're at a certain point, as a point on a map. So you have your GPS location. You draw a dot on the map saying, oh, I, I was right here. And then my DOA while I was right here is in this direction at this heading. And so you start drawing these lines on the map, and you can kind of start estimating uh, geolocation, where these lines kind of start to intersect. And so that's what this video is of. Uh, and you can, you can look at it if you want. You can watch us walk around campus taking, taking measurements. Uh, the code for our, our custom GNU radio blocks, we were able to make public here. They're sitting on GitHub. And you can, you can laugh at all our mistakes and all the, the funny problems we had in our code, maybe. Hopefully, it's helpful if you're interested. And, uh, and in the end here, we'd like to thank the LTS in Maryland who were funding this research and, and all their work that they helped us to accomplish here. If you're interested, the, there's auxiliary slides for those of you who enjoy the math section of things. And this is the, the phase difference method in more, in more detail. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right.